תודה דוד, ותודה בכלל על ההזמנה להצטרף אליכם בפורום הנחמד הזה. האמת היא שהתאכזבתי קצת, כי ראיתי את הבמה בחוץ, וחשבתי מיד, ואז הוא אמר, לא, אתה טועה. האמת היא שגם התלבטתי להעביר את ההצגה שלי בעברית. אני ביליתי, גרתי הרבה שנים בארץ, וחשבתי אולי כדאי... להעביר את זה בעברית, אבל בשל ההידרדרות רמת העברית שלי והזמן המוגבל שלי הערב, כי זה לוקח המון זמן בשבילי לחפש למילים שכבר שכחתי, החלטתי מאוד מהר להעביר את שאר ההצגה שלי באנגלית, אז אני מתנצל מראש, אבל התפשרתי בגלל שהחומר שלי, רוב החומר שלי, בעברית. אז אם יש שאלות, גם כן אשמח מאוד uh, לקבל את השאלות שלך בעברית. טוב, uh, so the, the title of my talk is מחפש סיבה לנשום, and I'm going to provide a general overview. Can you hear me in the back? Just raise your hand. Okay, good. I'm going to give a general overview about some of the things that we've learned over time about air pollution health effects. And what has compelled really all of us who are here tonight to do what we're doing and to essentially dedicate our professional lives towards studying these issues. First, I wanted to share with you some results of a sampling campaign that uh, I and another one of my colleagues, Jamie Schauer, was involved with here in Israel. And I think I just, okay. Uh, and this was from uh, 2007. And This particular study, in this particular study, we measured a type of air pollution called uh, PM 2.5, Chakikim Adinim, at a number of different sites throughout the region. Every six days, we had a measurement of Chakikim, and this shows you some of the concentrations for a short period of that year where we were doing the sampling. And you can see on this axis over here, the concentration Of Chalkikim. So one of the things that you see is that there is a difference from day to day. On some of the days, the concentration is sort of high. And in fact, on some of the days, the concentration is above the Tekken that has been decided by the Misrad uh, of what is healthy in terms of levels of Chalkikim. So on this day over here, It's around this time of the year. You see that there was a little bit of an elevation, and on some other days there was a little bit of an elevation of Chalkikim. And you see that this was from Haifa, a, 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 a site that we set up in Haifa, in the Veshanan. And you can also see at other sites throughout the country, in Tel Aviv and Yerushalayim. Similarly, there was this elevation on a number of these days, but you see one especially high a group of concentrations on this day over here in May. The interesting thing was that it wasn't just affecting Tel Aviv, Haifa, and Yerushalayim, but we also were conducting measurements in other parts of the Middle East. And we see that, if I can get this to work, that <laughs> even in Shechem, Amman, and Zarka in Yarden, that they also I'm assuming they were not celebrating Lag Baomer, <laughs> maybe, but they also felt the effects of this particular source of Chalkikim. And so with that, uh, perhaps a day late, I do want to wish you a Chag Zium Avir, Lo Kokach Sameach, and use this as a means of talking, telling you a little bit about what we've come to know about not just Chalkikim Adinim, but other sources of air pollution as well, and why we're, we're actually not so happy to be celebrating these kinds of phenomena. So it turns out that there actually is a lot of uh, awareness towards Lag Baomer in particular, especially recently. We can just look in the papers and see the headlines. This is from a few years ago in 2012. You can see that this headline, it notes Kamut P3 million Bahir, okay, okay, fairly high. We can see from other headlines, Ad P6 million Mutar, and even from last year, 
we see ad p shvasre miyom bahir. And so this concern over the exceedances above a normal day or above the Tekken has certainly become something that in Israel we're becoming more and more aware of. Okay? And in fact, where was that uh, Shvasre recorded, the, the 17 times higher than a clear day? It happens to be in B'nai Brak. It's not such a surprise, maybe, but uh, you can see that throughout the country at other sites too, there were these very, very substantial elevations. Now, I'm sorry, I did actually uh, work with Yael to, uh, to uh, Yael Etzion to look at the real-time readings from today, from last night, and we, we actually did look a little bit at the data, but I can't present anything right now about the uh, specific of impacts from yesterday's Lag Bom and Medurot, but uh, you can see that over time there is this, this kind of growing awareness of the impact, the air pollution impact, and it's not just on the levels themselves, but it's on potentially the health effects from exposure to these levels. So here, for instance, I just you know, took this little piece over here that, yes, there are certainly uh, concerns about uh, the impact of, the, of this particular source of pollution on global warming, global climate change, but also on machalot shaloneda uvofen klali mezik lanu. Okay, what does this mean? Okay, on machalot shaloneda. Okay, so what do we know about those effects, those health effects? Okay, and what should we be concerned about from things like this? Well, the concern, or at least the awareness over the impact of exposure to air pollution, is not a new thing. In fact, I came across this article, and I don't know how, uh, in a journal of uh, physical anthropology about an uh, anthropologist or archaeologist who was able to detect in lungs of mummies, of a particular mummy, preserved mummy in their lungs, evidence of exposure to, to air pollution. And in this case, what this particular researcher found was that there was a discoloration or a pigmentation of the lungs in this particular mummy that was indicative of certain deformities in the bronchii of the mummy itself. And what they attributed potentially this, uh, these deformities to was exposure to biomass burning, like Baumer. Biomass is just things that, uh, sources of, of, of fuel, wood, uh, dung, that was burned indoors and used to control for insects and pests and exposure to sand. And in fact, there was even this glyph, hieroglyph over here that archaeologists say indicates swelling inside, internal swelling that could also have been related to some of what people knew back then happened frequently. So I bring this as a way to say that some of the questions that we're asking and about the health effects from exposure to air pollution are very old indeed. In fact, thousands and thousands of years old. In fact, from, oh, from our tradition as well, if I can get this to work, um, we have uh, individuals who were interested in air pollution. A little known fact of the Rambam is that you know, he was also uh, very interested in the environmental engineering aspects of, uh, of exposures. And I found this quote to be especially interesting because in some ways, especially from a modeling standpoint, these are exactly the same kinds of factors that we think about today. So again, throughout history, there is this interest and awareness of air pollution. And from a health effect standpoint, one of the troubling aspects of exposure to air pollution is that it seems like everything bad that can happen to you, to happen to your body, can somehow be linked to exposure to air pollution. And you may say to yourself, how is that possible? And we're asking ourselves, how is that possible? What is the biological plausibility of this? Initially, when people first starting, started studying air pollution, naturally, the first place that people looked was 
in the lungs, in the respiratory system. And certainly we have plenty of evidence to suggest that exposure to high levels of air pollution can be associated with a number of different endpoints, health outcomes, some minor, some more serious. But over time, we've become, began to see observationally that, oops, sorry, that again, as I said, that many different systems, biological systems, seem to be impacted by exposure to air pollution. And we've begun over time to piece together the questions of how this is possible. So it's very troubling to us that it's not just lungs that are affected, but throughout our, 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 our bodies that we're concerned about adverse outcomes from air pollution exposures. One of the key studies that really shaped the way many modern uh, air pollution health effects researchers think about what they do and the questions that they're asking was called the Harvard Six Cities Study. The Six Cities Study was, as the name suggests, a study that was conducted in six US cities. Uh, the cities themselves were chosen because they represented a range of different air pollution levels. Some cities were cleaner, some cities were dirtier. All in all, there were over 8,000 people in this six city study. And what the researchers did was they measured air pollution over about 15 years, 14 to 16 years, and, um, and they published these results and came up with some very striking findings that, again, propelled a lot of what we do today. And I wanted to show you, I wanted to share some findings with you. So this is a famous picture from one of the most important uh, publications from the Harvard Six Cities study, which shows the concentrations of Chakikim Adinim in the six cities. So this was the cleanest city. It's a city in Wisconsin. And Steubenville, the city up there in the corner, was the dirtiest city. Okay, so over those 15 years, the average concentration of Chalkikim for Portage was around 10, 11, whereas in Steubenville, it was almost three times higher, around 30 or so. And they plotted these mean concentrations against the Sikuni Chasit Muta Mukdemet, okay? Controlling for other factors that could explain excess mor mortality, what we call it. They plotted these different cities, and what they found certainly was very striking, that you could go straight up to the lowest, to the cleanest, and the dirtiest cities, and see that almost a linear association, okay? And what the findings suggested was that people who lived in the dirtiest city, Steubenville, had a 26% greater risk of dying early than people who lived in the cleanest city just because of this difference in Chakikim Adinim. Very striking. You say 26% greater risk. What does that mean? If you think about it from a risk standpoint, that meant that people in Steubenville lived one to two years less than people in Portage just because of this pollutant. Oops. And that Findings like this and many, many, many others have led researchers today to estimate that exposure to outdoor air, to out, to air pollution actually is responsible for, across, over the world, 7 million excess mortalities each year. In fact, a colleague of, of ours tonight has been involved in this study that was put out. This is the global burden of disease effort put out by the Ergun of Riyut Alami and which places air pollution as the number one environmental risk factor among the many environmental risks that are out there. What happened over time since the study, the Six City study ended? Well, it ended around in the 90s, the late 80s, and that actually things got better in the, much of the United States. In fact, concentrations in each of those six cities if you think of the period after that study was done, of Chalkikim went down. So you say to yourself, well, if living in a, bad, in a polluted city is bad, what happens if you improve the air in a polluted city? You would think that if there's a relationship, then your health would improve, right? And that's what researchers tried to do in a follow-up study of the six cities. 
So here's the original graph with the original concentrations from the first time period, from 78 to 89. If you take a look at what those concentrations were like in a follow-up period from 1990 to 98, we see, first of all, Steubenville, which had the concentrations up here, now had concentrations down here. And that was the same pretty much for every single city. Every city shifted to cleaner, to better levels of pollution. And sure enough, almost every single city decreased in their excess mortality. A very important finding that kind of showed the reverse of the first study, right? That if you improve air pollution, you actually improve public health. So we've tried in the states to improve public health, and a lot of that has been done through the Clean Air Act. And one of the criticisms of many types of legislation or regulation in the United States is that it costs too much money, that it, 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 it provides a weight on the economy, that it's too restrictive, and that it costs too much. And certainly, the cost of the Clean Air Act is not small in the United States. If you look at the costs in the orange bars here, you could say that in total, the cost was about that's not small. Okay? However, if we calculate what the benefits of that particular act have been based upon a lot of the health effect studies that we've conducted, we see the benefits completely dwarf the costs. In fact, the Clean Air Act in the United States has been one of the most successful pieces of legislation from a public health standpoint, but also in terms of its cost effectiveness. So where does that leave us with what's going on here? Well. Well, oh, OK, and one slide before that leaves us. If we look at specific outcomes, we can look at what, how many extra cases we could have expected if we did not have the Clean Air Act. So if you look at mortality on the top there related to Chalkikim Adinim, if we did not have the act, we can estimate that in 2020, we would have had 230,000 excess mortalities just due to the fact that the Clean Air Act was not there. If we add up all of these different outcomes, not just mortality, not just tumuta, but all the lost days of work, the school days that kids miss, the bronchitis, the heart attacks, we see that the, the public health impacts are very considerable. Where does that leave us here? Well, here, too, I'm, I hope that many of, the, of us in this room are familiar, or if you're not, that recently uh, in, uh, we, we passed a Chok Avionaki, which is in the stages of being implemented right now. It actually is a very stringent Chok, and I think that it actually bodes well. It suggests that maybe good things, if followed, will also be experienced in Israel. So that as we move into the future, will not only have a greater appreciation oops, of the sources of pollution and what their levels are potentially like, but how those levels then translate here to actual health impact. And hopefully we will, in this country, experience some of the same public health benefits as we've experienced in the United States from what I think has been a very effective uh, intervention that has been driven by science. So with that, I wanted to sort of open up uh, for questions, or do we have time? We'll do it afterwards. Okay. So thank you very much. And.